So Shri, I'm very happy to turn it over to you and lovely to see you. Thank you, Masha. I am so happy to be here and I'm finally seeing you after six years, I think, yes. Um, first, thank you um, for this opportunity. I'm so excited to be here. I uh, want to share about a little bit of what I do um, for a living here in India. Um, I graduated 2014, um, came back to India the same year, and then I started working with this um, craft organization where we do a lot of development, uh, product development, textile development at the cluster level. I'll come back to what a cluster is during the uh, course of my presentation. So today um, I would like to share the screen. So I'll just go ahead and do that. Okay, um, so I'll just jump into uh, the presentation and uh, I'll take questions at the end of it. So the topic I've chosen today is the relevance of design. In, in the Indian handloom craft perspective, uh, what you see on the right, um, my right, yes, is the whole India uh, map of India with a lot of textile textures. Um, this is basically like a whole melting pot of how many, uh, each state has a lot of uh, textile traditions, cultures that have come over the years that have evolved over the centuries actually. Uh, jumping, as most, uh, as most stories have a beginning and once upon a time, uh, Indian textiles also has a once upon a time. We start off with the journey of textiles. Um, there is, uh, as we uh, understand, uh, tech Indian textiles has evolved from uh, the Indus Valley civilization dating back to 3250 to 2750 uh, BC. So we've, we're looking at uh, textile traditions that are that old. Uh, we have fragments from that age that typically point out that, you know, um, our textiles, uh, we have woven textiles since that era. Uh, written evidences are available. Following that, written evidences are available uh, that clearly state that Indian cotton and muslin fabrics were traded with Romans and uh, silk was traded through China via the silk route to the Western countries. So we're talking about a, a very old tradition here. Uh, if you look at the centers, uh, top center and the right um, imagery, uh, this, these are from uh, mural paintings uh, dated back to the 11th to 12th century uh, from the cave temples in central and southern India. We do note that there are fabrics being used as garments, as upholstery material. So some form of textiles were surely present, though not what we know as of today, but some form of textiles were surely present um, during that time. Uh, following that, like uh, this lady draped in a nice, beautiful uh, cotton silk fabric, this belongs to the Mughal era. So Mughal, with the Mughal empire that got into India by the 13th to 14th century, a uh, lot of these weavers started getting patronage from the royalty. So this era saw a lot of creation of new fabrics. This was the Malmal, uh, the brocades and the Jamamar, which is the weft, uh, extra weft techniques. Uh, with the boundaries of the empire expanding, we saw a lot of um, areas being included in the textile traditions. This was the Northern Kashmir, the Persia. So a lot of these motives, we started seeing influence uh, in the Indian textiles. By the 17th century, India was looking at, was producing about 25% of the world textiles. So that's a lot of textiles we were producing and these were entirely handloom. Uh, late 17th century, which is 1600s, late 1600s, uh, East India Company came into India, but, we, uh, but was forcing the weavers to sell uh, the material, the product produced only to, uh, only to the Britishers at a very, very minimal uh, amount. So the weavers started looking into the poverty, you know, getting into poverty, and this was accelerated by the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this blue image here at the bottom is basic, is a kind of, this was pre-Jacquard and um, the, uh, the extra warp was always, you know, bound, uh, wound like this uh, onto an extra uh, rod and then each pick, each pick had to be lifted and, you know, the had to be inserted. 
so it's a lot of manual work we do see this technique still being used in northeast india but obviously the production has decreased quite a bit um with the industrial revolution came the jacquard these are the jacquard cards that uh, are still being used in so many parts of india right now uh, we do not have these floppy disks and you know those kind of technology yet um so this is the basic of the i mean this is the start of how the uh, indian textiles have evolved um next comes this most important um, phase in the indian um, indian textile history so mahatma gandhi ji uh, is known is father of our nation known to have started the swadeshi cause swadeshi basically means self uh, swa is the self and desh means country so basically anything that is produced within the country becomes swadeshi um in no other nation has something as basic as clothing uh, or a act of spinning cotton has become so inter intertwined with uh, national movement spinning wheel and khadi have become a dominant symbol of uh, self reliance self determination and nationalistic pride uh, so this so with this pandemic and this uh, concept of self reliance is coming back as we know we're going through this pandemic and uh, most of the artisans or weavers are right now sitting on so much stock that we are looking at um that we are looking at a lot of uh, you know consumption within the country we are saying many people are doing uh, are believing what do you um, uh, how do you support the artisan sector how do you support a um, lot of these people are sitting on so much stock because international exports um, export orders have been cancelled and uh yeah the state is pretty horrible right now so the entire concept concept of self reliance is where uh, you know it's coming back into circle right now um moving so the current industry the current handloom industry um this is kind of the statistics that we have right now it employs about 4.5 million people um this is both directly and indirectly when i say directly indirectly it includes uh dyers includes spinners um it includes anybody that is even closely as associated with the cloth making um this is in fact the second largest employer after agriculture in the country we have accounted for 2.4 million looms in the country right now this is inclusive of pit looms frame looms jacquard looms sample looms all kinds of looms right now is accounted to about 2.4 million this is documented there's i'm sure 20 25% more that is non documented most of the most of the um most of the looms are basically at home uh, weavers at uh, use it at home uh, weaving is actually a family uh, uh, family uh, enterprise so the wife is doing the warping the uh, kids are doing uh, weaving sometime at the night so it becomes a whole family affair to most uh, most weaver uh, families uh, i have put in the image images here of the process of how the uh, you know warping how the uh, weaving happens in most of the handloom clusters um so when i say clusters we have identified about identified about 1000 plus clusters across india when i say clusters there are about 15 20 uh groups of um groups of looms groups of artisans coming together in in a particular uh, uh craft a particular we doing the same technique across the region so this is what a cluster is known um is formed for um so you have these women on the top right doing um this this is actually the uh, application of starch on cotton just before weaving so that the yarns don't stick on the left uh, this lady is segregating the yarn so that the warping happens pretty easily then we have women a group of women uh, trying to strengthen or stretch the fabric onto the loom um, and then the weaving uh, the pit loom itself so uh, so all of this is like a whole community activity rather than an individual activity right now and that's how the indian uh, handloom industry looks uh, in the current scenario post independence which was in 1947 is when we got independence post independence we have seen a lot of development or focus that has happened in the in handloom sector we have something called as a national handloom cooperative development organization that offers yarns at subsidized subsidized rates to the artisans 
um, they they have something called as a um, something called as a weaver service center where all weavers can go and you know gain uh, some sort of help in terms of monetary compensation in terms of design development. So all these developments have been ha happening over the years, but the amount of people and amount of uh, work that have good that goes into making a handloom is quite substantial. And um, so where does where and how does design feature in this whole scenario? Uh, we have seen such a large history, such a rich history of textiles. So obviously, many of these artisans have are well versed in what they do. Uh, they know their work. So where does design stand? How do you de how do you define design as such in this handloom, um, in the sea of handloom? For me, when I got into handloom, it uh, it was very necessary to understand who my market is. It is very under it is very necessary to understand the gaps that we are addressing. It is always good to understand the challenges that uh, that comes with the uh, you know that is part and parcel of whatever job you're doing. So for handlooms, what are the challenges? Uh, most of these weavers, artisans, they're mostly illiterates. Um, they do not understand now because we have so much, you know, uh, then uh, internet is everywhere. They do have access to phones, a uh, good quality phones, but before 10 years, they did not have that facility. So most of these artisans were uh, remotely located. They do not have cars to take their produce and sell it anywhere. They have to rely on other sources and uh, weak market linkages is because of these location uh, constraints. Uh, market linkages basically are of two kinds. One, they can sell it in their local, uh, local villages, local uh, towns, but in the larger scenario, how do they get their products across to a larger metro? How do they uh, you know, send it across to somebody who is 2000 miles away. That is, that is what is the constraint here. Um, they are aware of exhibitions. They have small fairs that they sell in. And this is the amount of revenue that comes in is not enough to sustain a family through even three months. So that, so these are the main challenges. Um, so when I, there's the third one is inadequate, I mean, inadequate in inputs. When you're talking about inputs, these are raw materials, these are monetary compensation. So when you're talking about uh, raw materials, if the locations are so remote, how do how does one get um, raw materials? So they use what they get. So they don't know whether they're getting cotton. They don't know whether they're getting they're getting polyester, polyester because they, there are no test labs. So they believe they're you know middlemen and they just get what they have, uh, what they what they um, what they get in the market. Um, lack of design inputs and technology adoption. This is one of the main criteria in um, getting the designs from where they are to where they need to sell. The gap needs to be bridged here. So when I'm talking about design, um, how do you solve these problems? These are some of the main uh, issues that comes about in any sort of design intervention that happens at the viewer level. We are supporting livelihoods here. We, we need, uh, yeah, we are supporting livelihoods here. So it, it is a matter of, it, it's not like a chance that you can take and you want to trial and error. It is a lot of thinking, a lot of um, accepting what your constraints are. Um, okay, why is it so important to look at the artisanal products? In this, and in this pandemic, we know uh, we are looking at sustainable living. We are looking at healthy, healthy living. So we understand that the that there is growing consciousness and go, growing ethical consumerism across the world. Whether I'm sitting in India, whether I'm sitting elsewhere, I need to know who is making my clothes. I need to know who is buying uh, what I have made and how it is influencing econo economically uh, to anybody. So that is, I think, some of our main questions that we need to answer and understand uh, for Sorry. Um, yeah, for if you look at the market size, right, in the US alone, um, this is, I think, 2018-19 statistics. In the U uh, US alone, the market for handcrafted products is about $50, uh, $50 million a year. This is across apparels, accessories, and home decors. I'm not even touching about the other home products that we're talking about. This is just, you know, in these three categories. 
the ethical there is also a growing demand for ethical indigenous products um the indian khadi which is the hand spun hand woven cotton the sales has grown about 33% year on year um this is very important for some for a for an indian market right now because we are talking about sustainability we're talking about growth of the indian artisan economical stature uh considering such a huge market what we constitute what india constitutes is about only 2% of the global market uh so that is really tiny and how do you make it big i have no clue and i think we are all working towards it towards uh making this number a little bigger uh when you when we are doing a design development in any cluster in any any form uh there are a lot of influences that we see in in the indian uh, scenario one is the social influence um i have put together this slide where on the left you have this group of uh, women you know uh, doing their daily activities so this is an embroidery coming to us from the northeast india uh the history goes that the uh, it is actually a chain stitch uh, running and chain stitch that uh you know that that it's a kind of quilting actually many layers of sari are stitched together and this is part of the woman's uh, wedding trousseau to take it to her husband house one the once she's married and things like that so when the child is about 6 years this this whole uh, piece of uh, art is starting you know she starts sewing this together and by the time she's uh, you know ready to get married this is part of her trousseau so there's a lot of social influence and what are the motives right so she sees her mom um, you know cooking fish every day so that is part of the motive so uh, you see she sees her neighbors her aunts her, her um, you know her sisters cooking cleaning whatever it is right the daily chores so that becomes like the motive language so that is what i have uh, you know shown on the top left uh, this close up of the uh, close up of the stitch is on the bottom now this is completely like for the self consumption now if you if i want to make this more economically um, substantial for the uh, you know artisan for the embroiderer it has to appeal to a larger uh larger target audience so who's my larger target audience right uh okay i have uh, in india it's you use sarees a lot so uh if i want the same stitch if i want the same uh, kind of treatment done to a saree i have to minimize the number of colors there are very few people who would use such multicolored sarees for an everyday wear or such multicolored sarees for anywhere they want to go like we always want to see something uh, you know subtle something very elegant so i'm looking at modifying these mo motives modifying this um, you know this uh, treatment to a larger uh, to um, to target a larger audience to impress a larger audience so that you know they can buy um on this on the on the uh, in the middle i have two sa samples of two stoles so this is uh stoll is not a is not technically an indian product it is consider it is um, entirely sent uh, it exported abroad to uh, to the us our main um, our main buyers are uh, in the us australia and europe so stoles are sold mostly to international buyers so they look at stoles they look at shawls so these embroideries are adapted to uh, to products like this now considering this from social you going to global um there are there are lot of changes that you have to do so for us as designers for me especially i know when you have i i can say that you know i I'll, i'll sell what i want i will sell i will make the design that i like but it doesn't work that way you have to understand what the social influences are you and you have to understand what how minor changes can matter in a larger extent uh into to a larger population so that's that's where the social um yeah the social influences you have to understand the social influences then there are cultural influences um on the left so this this actually the sari is uh, silk cotton and comes to and, and is woven in the mid, uh, middle india so central india actually silk cotton and if you see the border this is this is a, a motif that is influenced by the river that is flowing in this in the town so all these motifs come very naturally to them because this what they weave is what they observe the motifs at the bottom in the bottom picture these are all influenced uh, inspired 
by the local fort there so motives the language that you know is woven into the into the sari into the product is very very uh, natural is very very uh, you know um, it is very imbibed with with cultural influences now how do i take this to the international market what changes can i make it make to this product so that it appeals a larger audience on the right is something that we have done in terms of color change so you introduce a blue introduce a green so that it it is not very um, it is not very uh, constricted to a regional area so um, so from the also i think uh, what I, what we have what i have understood in the last few years is what sells in the north india does not sell in the south india same east to west so each region has its own preference of colors its its own preference of season as well same thing goes india and export so what color sells in india does not sell abroad so it's a lot of understanding of what who your target market is that is very important in understanding the cultural influences of any any space um so i'd like to take you through this design intervention i was part of this is a project that went on for about a year year and a half um it was part it's in the southern area southern india we're looking at one cluster that weaves this kind of a sari the body border and the pallu which is the edge the end the red part of the body is woven woven separately and then joined by the interlock technique um this is actually this sari was uh, woven started uh, was started uh, woven in uh, 16th 17th century and uh, basically right now what is happening is it's being woven with polyester we wanted to see and and the sari costs about 10 to 12 dollars so that's that's like a really and it's six yards so that's like really uh, inexpensive now how do you make this uh, how do you make this more sustainable how do you make this more economically viable to the artisan was a, was the main concern uh, for this dying art actually so we conducted this project uh, where we wanted to understand what the basic difficulties of the uh, cluster were basic difficulties were the artisan were interesting part of this uh, this um, technique or a, this craft is it's woven by uh, the husband and wife the husband weaves the red part uh, where it's a lot of inter interlock weaving and the wife weaves the body of the sari so it's it's basically like a husband and wife you know uh, they weave it together uh, so we said okay how do you understand this sari how do you want how do you want to change it so we wanted to convert this art silk Uh, polyester sari into completely cotton uh, cotton was in in available at the cluster at that time um, so we said okay you know uh, so the whole cluster development projects we had to explain to them what we are trying to do so a gathering i think we went through about 3 to 4 gatherings of inviting artisans inviting weavers together and explaining the product itself explaining what we were trying to do um so so we said okay uh, that was one and we wanted to other than the green and red they usually weave the sari green and red we wanted to introduce a neutral color the black and white is the simplest one it appeals to the whole appeals to everybody um it's it's an easy color to uh, you know the neutrals appeal to a larger audience so we said okay this is what we are going to do and introduce this one uh, the first difficulty that we uh, that we faced was black is not a very acceptable color anywhere it is not accepted in the uh, for any festival any wedding we do not use black at all it is considered a bad omen actually i do not know why i just love the color but still um, it is considered that way so when we said okay black is something that i want to use everybody said no we are not, we cannot use it at all uh the wife said no i have to ask my husband the husband said i am not sure about it so we, there was a lot of these discussions that went on for about 2 to 3 months a uh, second problem we do not we did not have the count of yarn in cotton available in the cluster so we had to form a whole society that could procure this yarn itself to the cluster so the so one uh, was the social stigma second one was the yarn count yarn not available once the once the sari started coming about once we started weaving the product itself 
it's it it was beautiful on the loom right but then they have not sold this color ever so they said how is it going to sell how is it going to even look uh, appealing to to anybody so we took it to so this is the before and after the green and the red is the typical um the black and the white so we took it to the lakme fashion week uh, of india this is one of the most prestigious fashion weeks um uh, it happens during uh, february and august it actually so we took it here and we got an amazing response the sari is paired with a short here and then it's appealing to a large uh, a younger target audience and after this the amount of audi- the amount of uh, sales that the cluster got for this particular sari saw about 35% increase and per sari the weaver was able to get 40% more value so this is something so this was like a success story right so from but the thing on the other hand it took about one and a half years to get one sample out of the loom so it's a lot of effort from everybody but it did make uh, you know it it did make a lot of difference and how the cluster is working right now so now that we have experimented with new colors we have experimented with new techniques it has made a different in, a difference in people life so many of these viewers are adapting to this new form of weaving as adapting to this new form of color scheme they often come back to us saying you know can i make something new can i make something different how do i make these changes so it is very uh, it is very um, actually uh, humbling to see such a response from the weaver itself so often when we do these design developments it's un- uni- we have to understand what is happening at the level we have to understand the ground reality and sometimes it just sometimes it fails sometimes it just takes off and it's it's always a great learning at every stage so uh, with that i uh yeah thank you for this opportunity i hope uh, it was interesting to all of you i'm happy to take any questions shree that was fantastic thank you um we do have quite a number of questions for you and oh, i okay, and i hope they're easy i hope they're easy <laughs> selfishly i i have to say that this particular slide makes me even more I uh, wish I had been able to visit you in March as we had planned. So, oh, I I I'm waiting for you to visit Marsha. I have this whole trip planned. <laughs> um so, okay. I understand the Better Cotton initiative is working to move Indian producers to grow and use organic cotton. Do you see any effect of the sustainability movement on the Indian weaver/printer community? Um Yes I think organic uh, see or when we say organic cotton it is easy to say okay I'm going to grow organic cotton uh, it is not that easy because um, cotton itself for, at every stage you have to maintain the organic certification so that is something that all of us have to understand that every stage has to be organic for it to be uh, certified as organic I I just can't make the final product saying okay this is organic cotton so there is a lot of education involved there is a lot of hard work at the ground level that is involved to actually get organic cotton so that's i mean that's 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 a process i'm sure it's evolving it will take some time in the indian scenario thank you with with textiles being such a rich part of indian india's history were textile crafts part of every household meaning did you grow up practicing a form of weaving or or perhaps other textile crafts um yes i did um i grew up watching my mother do crochet all my aunts did um uh, some sort of embroidery some sort of, sort of knitting from for a south indian uh, i am from south india so for us it textiles some uh, yeah it has been part of growing and hence i think that's why it mattered so much that i do something with my hands i think if if you are grow, if you have grown up in south india all your cousins all your brothers sisters everybody is an engineer for me it mattered that i wanted to do something that is so tactile that i wanted to experience so yeah it was it was a no brainer for me textiles or something to do with the crafts was going to be part of my life i think uh, i think i don't know if masha remembers i always see the wrong side of the fabric to understand how it's woven <laughs> 
that is that is just yeah that's how i've been my brains have probably like uh, yeah rewired or something you were you were destined to go into textiles that's what i yes think. yes yeah. so here's a question regarding the clusters. So how did the cluster come to accept the black color of the saris? Ah, it was a lot of convincing actually. Um, initially the viewers said, we are not going to do it. Do, whatever happens, we are not going to do it. Uh, we did show a few examples of how black has evolved. So we said, okay, it doesn't have to be exactly black. Uh, initially, the, I wish I'd show that initial. Initially it was just black on black. To make them more acceptable, to make them more convinced, we said, okay, we are going to use white, which is like a yin yang sort of a thing. So that, that's, I think, broke the ice saying, you know, okay, so something is going to be negative and a positive. So a lot of these things are trial and error. Um, none of the weavers accepted it. We luckily found one gentleman who said, you know, I want to try. He was a little elderly. Uh, he said, okay, I'm going to try it and see. So usually all these weavers go to one head head weaver or master weaver and they listen to him. Whatever he says is like, uh, you know, they just accept any word. So he said, okay, you know, I'm going to try it. If this works, then everybody's going to work, work with it. So he said, oh, I'm going to try it. So he tried it on his loom first. And yeah, that's how luckily we had a success. Like I'm saying, it doesn't, all projects don't have to succeed, but it's a lot of learning at every stage. And I would imagine that that when some of the other weavers see the success of this, then they become perhaps more open yes. to, to recommendations. Yes, like I said, they, like I said, there are 40% increase in wages, right? Now, who doesn't want more money? Whether I'm <laughs> in black or whether I'm in blue, it doesn't matter. At the end, I'm selling more saris than I than I was selling six months ago. So it, it just, uh, you know, the money... Actually, it, it now uh, initially 10 weavers were weaving this color black and white. Now they have made changes with the stripe. They made it into checks. They've done all sorts of things. I think at least 42 weavers are weaving this right now. This is a great follow on question. Could you explain further the initiatives that are put in place to better assist the artisans in understanding how they price their work so that it is a sustainable practice in that they can have a proper living wage as opposed to being too low or, or exploitive? Um, unfortunately, that still happens because their uh, organization, I work for an organization called Go Co-op. So we're trying to enable um, artisans to come online and sell directly to, art, uh, to you know, customers so that there's no middleman. Once they are, they are exposed to a middleman, what happens is the, it, the product exchanges three, four hands. So what the artisan gets versus what customer buys it at, it has already changed about 3x. So I'm selling it at 100 rupees and somebody's selling it at 1000. So there's a lot of gap. So we're trying to see how to address, how to remove the middleman uh, to make it more viable for the artisan itself. Um, second thing, costing wise, they have to understand that whether they're selling it online, whether they're selling it offline, it has to be um, it has to be, you know, a uh, customer has to accept it. Uh, yes, it is a lot of hard work. It is a lot of time put into the product itself. But in the end, if it is not worthwhile, if I'm saying, okay, I'm making it with silk, but if it doesn't impress anybody, whether it costs like thousand rupees or 2000 rupees, it does not matter. You have to understand what the customer needs. I think that's, that's very important for the artisan itself. Well, and that's that's certainly education. Yeah, at every cluster level projects, we do educate the seller saying, you know, this is what is required. This a lot of education, a lot of handholding is required. How do you cost the uh, yarn? How much do you cost a, cost the yarn for? How much is the consumption? How much margin do you keep? It is a very important lev, uh, you know uh, lesson for for all of us actually. That's fantastic. In in your very uh, in one of your original slides. Most of the people that you showed in the slide, most of the artisans were female. And then yes. you spoke about the sari where the husband wove one part and the wife wove another part. Yes. In the different clusters, do is there a different division of labor between men and women? Yes, yes. 
Um, usually women take care of the pre-loom processes. A lot of these spinning, uh, warp, um, you know, drafting, denting, um, the, uh, the on-loom processes have uh, the women take care. The weaving is mainly a man's job. I have no idea why. Um, only because of the strength or, you know, whatever it is, because it is a long, uh, it is about six, seven hours of, you know, manly, uh, whatever, physical work. So I think that's why the man takes up the uh, weaving rather than the women. Uh, women also take care of the other, I mean, household activities, which the man does not, right? So it's a clear, even in the domestic activities, there's a clear uh, distinguish. Uh, of labor. Uh, so I'm cooking and cleaning and all of that. So the man is like weaving. So this happens in most societies this way. Um, however, in the Northeast India, that's a total reverse. Um, women always weave. Every household has a loom and it's only the woman who does all the weaving. Um, whereas whether it is so uh, in that scenario, all the weaving happens as a community. So women, so today I am weaving in my house, my warp is set up. So tomorrow I am going to my neighbor's house and setting up the uh, warp for her. So it is a community uh, activity, actually. That, that's fantastic. Another question for you. How has change in technology post-independence affected the handloom industry? For example, Malasham's machine in Telangana Telangana. 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 Hopefully you know what the word is. Yes, it's the state. <laughs> and are there initiatives to decrease the physical toll on weavers? Um, why? Um, because I would say the handloom industry, for me, okay, there's a difference between a handloom and a power loom. And there's a lot of activities like the auto looms and things like that. But when I'm talking about the authenticity of handloom itself, that means every process is hand, hand, uh, you know, hand done. So if I'm looking at like a power loom, then the processes are different. Obviously the price that I'm paying for the power loom versus a handloom. Handloom comes to us at a premium and I want to retain that whether it is post-independence or pre-independence, the culture, the tradition of handloom is not going to go away. It should not go away. So I think all the revivalists are working towards sustaining this, bringing back age-old practices so that we do not lose our traditions. It, I mean, we can automate a lot of things. We can make, uh, make a lot of changes to the, uh, to the loom to make things easier, but it's not the same quality. Whether you want to compromise on that, it's it's an individual choice. Hmm. Also, um, with uh, can you repeat that question for the Telangana one, please? Sure. How has change in technology post independence affected the handloom handloom industry? Okay. For example, okay. Malasham's machine in Telangana. Okay. Okay. Um, also. Well, Telangana basically is also known for Telangana and Andhra area is also known for ikat specifically. What has happened is we know ikat is like a, uh, it's, it's a craft and 90% of the work is done at the yarn stage. So the last 10% in order to decrease the, uh, decrease the, uh, not, I won't say value, but the cost of production, they have taken up the handcrafted yarns onto power looms. So in the end, I am getting a handcrafted product, but my uh, but the weaving uh, is happening on Paulum, which is okay, because most 90% is already hand done. All my motives are done uh, are already handmade. So it should not make a di big difference whether I'm weaving uh, a power loom or a hand loom. Obviously, in different uh, different techniques, this this does matter whether I'm using a power loom or hand loom. But in ikat in Telangana specifically, I don't see that as a difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are you involved with artisans throughout the entire country? India, of course, is a massive country. Or is there a specific part of the country where your work is focused? Um, right now, actually, um, okay, our, the company that I work for, we are in about 12 states right now. Uh, we have worked with um, specifically four clusters from start to finish. We have associated, we have, if you go to our website, gocoop.com, I have 
we have we have about 140 artisans we have onboarded um, so who can sell directly to customers so we are trying to touch as many crafts as possible get visibility to as many artisans as possible through this small venture it's an 8 year old company and i have been in this company for about 5 years now thank you and i i want to note to everyone that in addition to uh, to this this, the website being on Shree's slide, Becky has also just put the link in the chat function to everyone. So Thanks, everybody Thanks. should go check that out. And, and I will be once we're, once we're done today. Okay. And are you working with artisans solely in weaving or also in embroidery and in other traditional Indian handcrafts? Uh, we do work with embroidery as well. There is an artisan cluster in north of the state where I live. Uh, this is an entire tribal, uh, 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 it's, it's a tribal women's uh, organization actually. So they have very, uh, so when I talk, so these are nomadic tribes. They have settled in this, uh, in this part of the state for the last, I think I want to say four to five decades. Uh, completely hand embroidered, completely uh, everything that I use is so beautiful in terms of color, in terms of texture. We are trying to work with this cluster to make it more um, acceptable to a larger audience. Um, I'm happy to share more images and whoever, I mean, if you can get in touch with me for more information on this cluster specifically, if you like. We do work with crafts, uh, you know, um, embroiderers. We, we do work with printers as well. Printers are basically located in north northwest of India, so we are associated with them. Uh, it's not just it's not just textile craft, also non-textile. We are starting to work with basket weavers. We work, start uh, to see how it is more um, how it is made more economically viable for them as well. It's just that uh, logistics takes a lot of um, thought process because some things bulky cannot be shipped very easily. You have to think of packaging that comes uh, with a lot of plastic and how do you make it more sustainable? So there's a lot more process and thought uh, thinking that is required for a non-textile product. Early on, you spoke about how the, the current global pandemic, it, despite all of the challenges in, in India and obviously across the globe um, has, has been challenging, but that also there's been an increase in self-reliance because of this. Could you speak yeah. a bit more about that? Sure. Um, right. Okay. Um, so with the artisans, we have we initially of, um, at twelve days uh, since the lockdown started in India, we reached out to about sixty of our sorry thousand sixty of our artisans and wanted to understand what the situation was. At that time, they were sitting up at about thirty three million. Yeah, that was 12 days, 33 million uh, in value of stocks. So that is just 12 days, right? Uh, plus you have a loss of uh, wages, you have a loss. Uh, and everybody, at uh, what happens is it's all seasonal. Now, uh, starting August, August to November is when the wedding season, when the festive season happens. So everybody started to weave last year so that they can sell during August and September. Now the pandemic has struck. So they're still sitting with stock without sales now they don't have money they, they cannot sell it anywhere so there's a so there's block stock they don't know what to do with it. second thing um we were some of the weavers are producing pro, uh, producing fabrics producing uh, uh furnishing material for the international market with with exports completely blocked their orders have cancelled so that stock is there and they don't know what to do with it because in India, you're not allowed to sell the international products in India unless the you know, buyer gives you a go ahead. So that is, you know, that is a lot of stock you're sitting on. So how do you see this? How do you move this around so that there is some sort of a cash flow? That was the main, that was actually, a, it, it is still going on. So many of them decided to sell on our platform. So we are looking at, um, you know, uh, moving this to garment industries, garment local garment uh, factories, so that they can convert these products into garments and they can sell it. Second thing, you can convert these into fabric masks. So masks took off like crazy. Everybody was producing masks with the stocks that they have. And also, what also happened was with the uh, with the remaining fabric, uh, with the stock that they had, they started. 
developing products they thought they just couldn't do it they started developing cushion covers they started developing table linen so it uh, there was a lot of upskilling also that happened at that ground level second thing uh, i think they also understood that it is not very uh, you know it is not though they work seasonally though though they work um, you know according to festivals according to uh orders it is not a very very uh, sustainable model so th- the whole thought process has actually started to change interesting hi shree hey megan um first i just wanted to say it's been so lovely to hear you speak about this subject um for those that don't know shree and i went to school together and we were very close friends so it's just been kind of a for me like very lovely just to experience this um thanks for you of course uh i was wondering so it seems like listening to you speak you have this really great broad overview of how the indian textile industry works mm-hmm. and from i you get this perspective from your job and i wondered if you could speak a little bit to your day to day and okay. specifically do you work directly with these uh clusters and then also kind of understand the whole world of of weaving as well <laughs> um i want to say yes <laughs> okay um okay i'll take these questions in part so what i do is on a day to day basis i work for this company i handle their uh, b2b uh, bulk business um also their brand development so the brand the in house brand is called the good loom and uh, yeah so i was i've i've been part of the conceptualization of the brand and how do you take it so gokwak basically is a marketplace it is very similar to amazon uh for handloom specifically so every product that you find on gokwak is handloom uh, based and we have been devel- we have been working with different clusters um at different intervals at least i work on three projects a year in developing new uh, new uh, you know de- with design intervention and all the products that come out of those projects is what goes under the good loom whether it is you know quality development whether it's at, uh, intervention at quality whether it's intervention at the basic level or just you know tweaking designs colors a little bit all those development because it is time right it is time and effort so all that comes under the good room this is what i'd want a larger scale uh what was the other question um just to, oh do you speak, do you work with them directly and it sounds yes, like yes. you do yeah yes 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 i think that is part of the pro, part of my work that i really enjoy uh because i i travel at least 15 days a month i'm at the cluster or you know i'm with the weaver so i am, so it is it is kind of a humbling effect for me so i am i stay grounded to my roots so i that is the best i enjoy at my job yeah and why did i take up uh, uh, a job at this was um as a designer i think i all of us have this uh, excitement that oh i have made this you know i this is the most beautiful piece of product or ever ever seen or whatever but um unless you know how to sell it unless you know how people react to it i don't think that design matters at all um it's always <laughs> yeah it is always uh, you know you always need to understand what is it that impresses anybody so whether but it's a choice right I, if i want to sell it to 1000 people where or if i want to sell it to 10 people it's a choice that you're making but you have to understand that choice I think that's a very good point. Are you able to uh weave for your personal use at all? No. No. <laughs> Masha, I didn't you didn't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I honestly don't uh I haven't woven in quite a while which I miss the most. So we do have a loom in the office and I whenever we have a new sample I try to at least, you know, break that uh, barrier between the customer and the artisan because i know how the we work so the initial sample i put in my thoughts and i say okay this is how you can change things around to make it more uh, production friendly excellent yeah shri thank you so much that was a fantastic presentation and uh, i know when we can 
I think many of us want to come visit. So. Please do, please do. I'm happy to host any number of people. Um, yeah, I'm I'm happy to yeah help any in any way I can. Again, our great thanks to Shri. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you, everybody. Have a good Bye. day. Bye-bye.